Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us. We are thrilled to have you with us and delighted to have our special guest today, Dr. Tessa Gomez, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Medicine in the Division of Infectious Diseases and the medical director of our Peter Kruger Clinic. Dr. Gomez, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Good morning, Matt. It's so nice to have you here. And, you know, I love hearing about uh, Peter Kruger because it's such a special place. Can you just briefly give us a little bit of the history of, uh, of Peter Kruger? Of Peter Kruger, certainly. So um, in the early 80s, at the height of the HIV AIDS epidemic, Beth Israel Medical Center, which we now know as Mount Sinai Beth Israel, was one of the first hospitals to identify the symptoms of and provide specialized care for patients affected by HIV. Beth Israel at the time had a strong clinical trials program for testing HIV treatments and medications. And the program initially started as part of the adult medical services clinic. And in the mid eighties, it became its own uh, clinic with HIV care and services for adult and adolescent patients. Now, at that time, Dr. Stanley Yankovitz, who we all know, was the family physician who provided care to the Kruger family here at Beth Israel. And with the passing of their son, Peter, due to complications of HIV AIDS, Harvey and Constance Kruger wanted to honor Peter by providing support for others affected with HIV AIDS. So in 1989, Beth Israel established the Peter Kruger Clinic through the philanthropy of the Kruger family. And since its inception, the Peter Kruger Clinic has been a critical component of Mount Sinai Beth Israel's commitment to patient-centered care uh, as a training ground for HIV specialists and infectious disease fellows, and as a clinical trial site that has contributed to the development of life-saving HIV therapies. Additionally, I am also proud to share with you that the Peter Kruger Clinic has created a documentary movie entitled From Darkness to Light that showcases the different patients who are thankfully still with us, who started their care with the clinic, shared their life stories, received the medical treatment at our clinic from the very start. And in the documentary, there are current staff members who have been in the clinic since its inception, who speak about their experiences and the challenges they faced during the beginning of the AIDS epidemic. The movie has been accepted to a number of uh, film festivals, mm. notably the Toronto Film Festival. So all of this information you can find uh, online at Mount Sinai uh, website under Peter Kruger Clinic, and you can access the movie if anybody is interested in watching it. Thanks. Yeah, it's on my uh, it's on my to watch list now. Um, it is really such an amazing place. I always thought it was so um, special that P in all the the Peter Kruger Clinic has moved around a bunch of times, but it's always been like on a first floor where it's part of the community where people know that it exists. It's not buried in some you know back hallway somewhere. Yeah, absolutely. The new, uh, you know the new facilities now are really delightful. It's really so well. Yeah. Well, well, Peter Kruger started um, on First Avenue and uh, 17th Street uh, on the Avenue side, and then we moved to 17th Street between First and Second Avenue, and then uh, now we are uh, off-site on 9th Avenue, at, I mean 8th Avenue and 24th Street, where we uh, are providing services to a, a variety of of patients. Yeah. And, you know, the focus of um, Peter Kruger historically has been taking care of patients with HIV and AIDS. But I think today we're going to really talk about people who don't have HIV, right. um, people who are HIV negative and want to stay that way. Correct. And I think a, a big piece of staying negative is taking PrEP. Mm -hmm. So tell me a little more about about what PrEP about is PrEP. and why, why it's important, who should take it. Yes, um, PrEP is actually using uh, HIV medications, which is a widely recognized prevention strategy for ac the acquisition of HIV, especially those who are at high risk. So it's treatment as prevention, meaning treating people for their sake so they cannot transmit the virus. And it has gained widespread enthusiasm, mainly because behavioral preventive measures alone are often not sufficient. So this medicine that people at risk take 
to prevent the acquisition of HIV is indicated for HIV negative people and people who have, who have sex uh, with partner, who have sex partners who have HIV, who do not always use condoms, who have been diagnosed with a sexually transmitted disease in the past six months. It is also effective in HIV negative individuals who inject drugs. Um, it is important because the ultimate goal of PrEP is to prevent the acquisition of HIV infection with its resulting uh, morbidity, mortality, and the cost to individuals and society. The epidemic remains a significant global burden. And according to the UNAIDS, in low to mid-income countries, the rate of new infections is out, actually outpacing the rate of initiation of HIV medications. In the United States alone, based on the CDC data in 2018, which is the most recent year this information is available in the United States, one in seven individuals leave, living with HIV are unaware of their infection. So there is that appeal to achieve worldwide, a worldwide goal for reducing HIV infection nationally and federally. For instance, the HIV National Strategic Plan entitled A Roadmap to End the AIDS Epidemic in the United States between 2021 to 2025 and the federal initiative ending the HIV epidemic in the United States have called for a rapid and large scale up of PrEP provision by clinicians who actually provide care for HIV uninfected persons who are at risk of HIV acquisition. So by me as a primary care doc prescribing PrEP, which I do all the time, yeah. I'm actually helping stamp out worldwide HIV. Yeah, economic that. burden and preventing and re uh, reducing HIV infections. We are currently stable as the, at the most current data that we have in terms of new HIV infections, but there are still a lot of disparities, uh, particularly geographic, sex, uh, racial and ethnic distribution of persons prescribed PrEP, which is not equitable when you compare it to the distribution of new HIV diagnosis that could be prevented, like mm -hmm. African Americans, for instance, Hispanics, women, uh, people who live in the southern states have disproportionately low numbers of PrEP users. So, but, so we got to no spread one... that here, but also spread, spread yeah. usage in the south and Correct. Underserved communities. So which patients did you say we should really focus on? I think you mentioned zero discordant couples. So one partner's positive, yes. partner's negative. Um, what about men who have sex with men? That's, that's yes. the, the group of patients that I prescribe it to most. Correct. So men who have sex with men, um, uh, uh, HIV discordant, uh, heterosexual HIV discordant couples, Mm -hmm. And um, depending on the PrEP medication that you use, and Truvada is actually the oral PrEP medication that was first approved in July of 2012. Mm -hmm. That medication has been found to be safe and effective in the population you just mentioned, which are sexually healthy adults who are gay, bisexual, men who have sex with men, men who uh men and women in a heterosexual discordant relationship and heterosexual men and women who were recruited as individuals during the study when they did the Travada. Discovy, on the other hand, is only approved in men who have sex with men and transgender women at risk for HIV acquisition. Because in that trial, women, persons who are assigned female at birth, and other persons at risk through receptive vaginal sexual contact were excluded from the Discovy trial. So, because no one, no women or transgender men uh, were included in the efficacy and safety mm -hmm. portion of the PrEP trial. So uh, that is the difference between Travada and Discovy, which are the oral forms of PrEP that are FDA approved and available for PrEP use. Got it. So are there other are there other restrictions for who should be prescribed PrEP? Is there a certain number of sex partners or, you know, how often use condoms or some other yeah. test that, that I should be asking people before we prescribe them PrEP? I think that 
the way to approach it would be to ask them definitely how many sexual partners do they have if it's more than one then uh and, and they're not in a monogamous relationship so they are at risk if they engage in a anal sexual contact that is another risk factor if they don't use condoms uh that is definitely another risk factor so all of this taken together would uh make um, a physician decide whether or not the patient is right for prep but of course there's always uh we always have to make sure that they're not hiv positive first by doing an hiv test sure so we'll talk about the testing in a second so okay. we're doing you know we're having this sort of like risk benefit discussion mm -hmm. um for patients who so for um men who have sex with men for serodiscordant couples for iv drug users for certain patients of trans experience um depending on the number of partners you know it sounds like that that may weigh in the favor of prescribing medicine often truvada i guess Correct. um you know except for the subgroups where discovy is uh is an option for heterosexual couples or, or uh you know heterosexual people who have sex with multiple partners should we be considering prep yes i believe uh, I would recommend that if I ever saw the patient in the clinic and they are having uh, sexual contact with uh, different individuals, it is uh, an indication that PrEP should be recommended for those individuals. So we, so we can talk about those. And then and on the risk side, like what risks do I have to worry about for either Truvada or Discovy? Uh, the side effects, if that is... Uh, uh, so that is some of the things that most uh, individuals uh, ask me when they I discuss PrEP with them. Mm -hmm. the side effects are very mild. Uh, you could have a little bit of nausea, headache, um, and uh, abdominal pain sometimes. But these side effects are so minimal and easily tolerated and usually uh, go away within about two to four weeks of taking the medication. Got so, it. We used to worry more about like kidney <laughs> function and bone density and all those other things. Yeah. Are there sort of less? Um, yeah. So um, I know that with the approval of uh, Truvada, uh, of Discovy, there has been some uh, thoughts about uh, patients and providers themselves thinking about switching patient, uh, switching from Truvada to Discovy. But there is one clinical trial, that, which is a very large trial actually by Marcus and colleagues, who, where they actually looked at uh, switches to dis, uh, from Truvada to Discovy. And they, well, essentially, um, they looked at more than uh, 2,000 individuals who had PrEP prescriptions both in the year before Discovy was approved and the year afterwards in order to track the switches from Truvada uh, to uh, Discovy. And um, only men who have sex with men were included in that analysis. And uh, the outcome was that uh, relatively few of the PrEP users had poor kidney function or evidence of reduced bone density. And uh, in fact, there was more focus on the kidney dysfunction rather than the, um, than the bone, uh, kidney dysfunction, bone density, rather than obesity and uh, elevated lipids. And in fact, a lot of uh, those people who were uh, observed to have these changes were so small as to not result in clinical illnesses. So their final analysis of that uh, study was that the increasing use of Discovy for PrEP may just inflate costs to the healthcare system without proportionate improvements in clinical outcomes for most patients. So it doesn't sound like bone density or uh, kidney function okay. was a concern for patients on either medicine, you're saying? Correct. Okay. Um, I also think that one should take a look at people who are at risk for kidney disease, such as people who have diabetes and hypertension, 
or whose kidney dysfunction is close to the threshold. Like if they are, they have a creatinine clearance between 60 to 70, for instance. So those are the individuals you have to weigh and see whether or not, if they've been started at Travada, should they be switched over to Discovy? And if, uh, and, and if so, then that is something that can be done because of their risks. But for my typical patient who's been on Truvada for years and it's going fine, leave them on Truvada. Yes, correct. Now, what about there's this new injectable medicine that's out? Yes. Is it approved now for PrEP? Yes. So it has been approved for PrEP. So aside from oral PrEP, we have the injectable PrEP, which is called Apritude or uh, Cabotegravir. It, is a, it was approved in December of 2021. And... Um, it uh, actually was studied in two separate trials, which included about 8,000 individuals. So it was a huge study. It compared uh, Apritude versus Truvada. And at, in that study, they uh, included everyone, uh, men who have sex with men, um, uh, bisexual uh, individuals, um, heterosexual men and women, and uh, cisgender women as well, and transgender women. So they excluded uh, IV drug users uh, in that study. And they found out that uh, there was a reduction in HIV uh, risk of about 69% in uh, men who have sex with men and transgender women, and 90% reduction in cisgender women versus Travada. So it, it has been. So it's, even be, it's even more effective than Truvada, significantly. Yeah, in that study, yes, because they have a, they had a superiority trial, mm -hmm. meaning one drug compared to another and see which one actually did better. Got it. So should I be switching my Truvada patients to cabotegravir? Maybe. Um, the uh, cabotegravir, I think, um, has to be in terms of whether or not one should put one on cabotegravir is something that needs to be um, thought about uh, meticulously because individuals who should be on cabotegravir should be individuals who are very committed to getting the drug every two months. They have to be informed that it, uh, it is an injectable uh, that is done in the gluteal muscle uh every so that's in their time. buttocks yeah in their okay. buttocks. yes in their buttocks not everybody um, watching this may have taken uh yes. you know yeah. anatomy 101 um in their buttocks and it has to be done every two months they have to come to the clinic in order to get their injection they have to actually be uh, we have to make sure that they are hiv negative before getting the injection so there are a number of things or maybe a number of uh, um, uh, uh, things that patients should think about mm -hmm. uh, when they want to go uh, with IV, with IM cabotegravir. Right. But some people may like it rather than taking pills every day. Correct. Right. Yes. So, uh, some, some patients would prefer that, especially that it can be given six, six times a year right. instead of taking I mean, a take medication. Okay. Yeah. So take me through the process. You know, I mean, I sort of think about my process when I'm starting somebody on Truvada, but what does somebody need to know if they're going to either start for the first time on PrEP or, you know, how often do they come back? What is the, yes. what's that whole circumstance? Sure. Like? Um, so when a patient comes in for PrEP, then you, you usually um, uh, get a complete history of the patient, including their sexual history, which is important to see if they are at risk. Uh, take some laboratory work in order to determine if they have any underlying kidney abnormalities or liver abnormalities. Um, give them uh, uh, counseling on um, the HIV uh, symptoms. If they do get HIV symptoms while taking PrEP, um, in addition, uh, tell them about the side effects of PrEP, discuss with them in detail about the side effects of PrEP. 
uh, they may ask because some of the patients now are very uh, educated and savvy and know that uh, Truvada can be associated with uh, bone and, and kidney problems. And the provider should be prepared to discuss those uh, problems with the patient and tell them what's best for them. Um, just as I said previously about Discovy and Truvada. And then if they are ready, um, there should be a baseline uh, HIV test. And for some people, uh, it includes also uh, sex the testing for sexually transmitted diseases, which are which are important, especially if they don't use condoms. Mm -hmm. And, and that's um, three site screening. I mean, we talk about that a lot. The, the screening, screening, screening or in the yeah. mouth, the pharynx, the rectal, and and the yep. urinalysis. Mm -hmm. um, those are important, and they need to. Well, if they're started on PrEP, the, some individual, some experts will wait for about a week after uh, the HIV test is negative before starting uh, PrEP because they want to make sure that the patient has been counseled not to be exposed, highly exposed to someone who is HIV uh, positive at the time. And then when you do start it, they have to come back every three months in order to monitor the kidneys and the bones and the uh, liver function test and to see if they're still HIV negative. Right, so sometimes people push back because I make them follow, you know, to come back and, and, and get months. tested and whatever. And, and so I have to remind them, I think that's New York State guidelines. Yes, that and is the New York State. good guide. about putting out guidelines about how often you have to come back and what testing to do every time. and. Yes. Um, people can find that online, but I think it's a really straightforward, nice um, uh, description of the yeah. of the of the guidelines. Yeah, yes. a guideline to follow. Exactly. Are there other questions that people ask you? I mean, you mentioned the bone and the kidney stuff, which has come up a lot today. Are there other things that people are worried about or want to know more about when they start? Just, yeah. Um, no, not not exactly anything else. I think they're more they're a lot worried about the kidneys. That is the most often discussion, uh, the most common topic of discussion that I have with patients. Mm -hmm. um, how are my kidneys, doctor? Or do you think I should switch to Descovy because I have, uh, I don't want my bones to be thin as I get older. And uh, so that is a discussion that one has with their provider when a patient comes in. Got it. But it sounds like you can, based on the study data you quoted, we can be pretty reassuring of, of their kidneys and their bones. Yeah. What in this world of of uh, video visits and telehealth, how how often are you doing their their follow ups in person versus by video? So uh, we haven't started yet our mm. teleprep, but it is something new that we are actually working on. And uh, IAM would like to make uh, take part a great part of this. And IAM is the uh, overall like yeah. Uh, the the IAM stands for. Uh, Institute for Advanced Medicine, for which Peter Kruger Clinic, along with four other clinics, are a part of. Mm -hmm. We provide HIV care and PrEP and PEP uh, services to these patients. So uh, overall, the IAM, or Institute for Advanced Medicine, is uh, very much invested in doing teleprep and applying it to our clinics. And they are trying to launch it to or pilot it in one clinic for now, in one of the IAM clinics, um, and and see how how things go from there. Basically. I mean, I will tell you on the primary care side, you know, we often all sort of alternate in-person visits and video visits, and it seems like it works out pretty well as long as people can come in and do the testing so that yeah. you can prove that their kidneys are okay and they're HIV negative and all that other stuff. Um, it certainly, you know, it saves them a trip. Uh, Correct doctor's visit Absolutely. for something that's really about symptom. Yeah. So I know that there's also some people aren't taking PrEP every day. They're taking on-demand PrEP. What's, Correct. what's that like? So uh, on-demand PrEP is uh, taking PrEP only when someone is not having sex regularly. So uh, it is a good fit for cisgender men who have sex with men Mm -hmm. and, as I said, do not regularly have sex. Um, and Truvada is the one that is used for on-demand PrEP. 
Viscovy yeah. has not been studied. If you take every dose, PrEP on demand is very effective at preventing HIV during anal sexual contact. It has been studied in bisexual men and cisgender gay men, but it has not been studied for use with transgender women or um, vagin uh, people who enga engage in vaginal sex. Um, the reason for that is because it takes longer for the drugs in PrEP to get into the vaginal tissue. So on-demand PrEP is not applicable to these individuals. It is also known as 211. So 211 is also called uh, on demand, event driven, intermittent, uh, non daily prep regimen, and you time it to, uh, the oral truvada in relation to sexual encounter events. Um, there has been no con uh, clinical trials or controlled clinical trials in the US that. Uh, actually approves the use of non-daily oral PrEP. But there has been studies, there have been studies in Canada and in Europe that say that it is effective of a, at about eight, more than 86% in those uh, population of patients. So and so what's the dosing regimen like? Yeah, so two pills in two to 24 hours before sexual contact, one pill 24 hours after the initial two pill dose, and then one pill, third pill, 48 hours after the initial two pill dose. So that's why it's called a 211. Okay. And what if people are having sort of repeated sexual activity over a couple of days? Then Eight. that is not for them. Okay. Uh, On-demand prep will not be for those individuals. So right. it's important that we make sure that that they take daily prep for for if they are actively uh, sexually active. Got it. Um, all right. I think we're almost out of time, but I wanted to just touch base for a moment about people who um, who aren't on prep and have some sort of sexual exposure. I guess to somebody either who's HIV positive or maybe their HIV status is unknown, but but. Um, you know, they're concerned. Correct. So that would be post-exposure prophylaxis. You take HIV medications at least within 72 hours of possible exposure to HIV to prevent HIV infection. So you could have, you could be exposed to HIV due to sexual contact, but that may be shared needles or equipment, injecting drugs. If you were sexually assaulted, then you need to be evaluated by a, by a clinician to see if you are uh, appropriate for post-exposure prophylaxis and those who are exposed to HIV at work, especially healthcare workers. So um, for both you, for both occupational, which is the healthcare worker, and non-occupational for other individuals, uh, it is important that they come and see a provider within 72 hours, and they need to take the HIV medications that is approved for use. Uh, for post-exposure prophylaxis for at least 28 days. And that is based on clinical studies in animals that prevented um, HIV acquisition in those individuals who took it for 28 days. Got it. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us to talk about PEP, post-exposure prophylaxis, PrEP, pre-exposure prophylaxis, and all the ways we can keep people uh, ne HIV negative. Correct. Uh, try to battle this uh, pandemic. This pandemic. Right. Thank you so much. Very good. Thanks for joining us, everybody.